Thank you. Good evening, Ben, uh, and a warm welcome to each and every one of you for this uh, our fifth presentation in this series one of uh, presentations on the oldest lodges. Um, this is the end of our first series, and we plan to have a second series beginning in September, although the date is still to be finalised. Uh, but this evening, of course, we are delighted to have Brother Malcolm McRae, a past master of Lodge Canningate, uh, co-winning number two, who will give us a talk on his lodge this evening. Uh, firstly, can I just ask you all please to make sure that you remain muted throughout and that you have your video working so that you can be easily identified. Uh, before we proceed any further, Brian, can I first of all introduce and welcome our Grand Master Mason, Brother Ramsey McGee. Uh, he will say a few words uh, later. Uh, of course, uh, uh, a warm welcome to our speaker this evening, Brother Malcolm McRae, and other members of the History and Heritage Group that, who are with us this evening, Brother Charles Winston, our Secretary, Brother Alistair Henderson, Brother Douglas Nicholl, and Brother Gordon Michie. Can I also uh, add a warm welcome to some other uh, high level, if I can say that, uh, Freemasons. Uh, this evening we're delighted to have uh, Brother Anthony Richardson from uh, Barbados, a uh, Royal Arts Mason. Uh, delighted to have Anthony with us this evening. We have Brother Tom Davidson, uh, who of course is Grand Lodge Almoner. Brother Andy Musher, Provincial Grand Master of Glasgow. Um, Brother James Bartler, Assistant Provincial Grand Master in Gloucestershire. Alexander McCreef, uh, Currently the Right Watchful Master of number three, and of course, our Grand Senior Warden. And if I've missed anybody with uh, senior rank, my sincere apologies. Well, I have uh, repeated uh, at, the, uh, at all of these meetings the aims and objectives of the History and Heritage Group. So if you've heard it before, I apologize, but I'm going to tell you again anyway. Um, we are a subgroup of the Information and Communications Committee, Brennan. And uh, we have a, a fairly extensive remit to identify, collate, record, preserve and promote the history and culture of the Scottish craft. And uh, again, on behalf of all of the members of the History and Heritage Group, we are absolutely delighted to be involved in such, uh, uh, in such an industrious uh, uh, effort. Um, I would mention very quickly that we do have another uh, History and Heritage uh, project underway at the moment, and I hope you've seen it. The, uh, uh, new oral history project where we're inviting members uh, to uh, uh, develop a short three to four minute uh, video of how they have uh, perceived themselves and uh, their families and the craft over the past four months during lockdown. So if you don't have enough information on it, well, I know that your Lodge uh, Secretary will be able to supply that, uh, as could Brother Charles Winston. So I would commend it to you, Brian. We have quite a number of uh, takers at the moment working on it, and the more the merrier. So please give it some thought, Brian. We would appreciate your involvement. Well, this series uh, one, uh, with series two beginning in September, on the history of our oldest lodges, is designed to remind our audiences that Scotland does have the oldest lodges in the world, uh, underlining the fact that Scotland is the home of Freemasonry. This evening's proceedings, Bern, of course, are being recorded and you'll be able to view them tomorrow in a, in a, in a series of uh, Facebook pages, Provincial Grand Lodge pages, etc. So please, uh, if uh, you want to pass it to others who can't join us this evening, please do and have them enjoy uh, this evening's uh, presentation. I would invite our, our host at this uh, stage just to make sure that everyone is muted, please. Um, tonight's presentation, as I've just mentioned, is the history of Canagate co-winning number two. Uh, undertaken by the uh, past master, Brother Malcolm McRae. We will have a question and answer session at the end of uh, Brother uh, Malcolm McRae's presentation, Bill, so please hold off until then. And in fact, it may be best if you do have a question, uh, if you could post it in the chat room, you will have a chance later on to, to uh, pose that question. And beyond that, if anyone has a question, of course, please just raise your hand. I now introduce uh, again, uh, right, what's all, uh, uh, most much of all, uh, uh, Grand Master Mason, Brother Ramsey McGee, and invite him, if you would please, sir, to uh, say a wee bit more about our speaker this evening, Brother Malcolm McRae. Thank you very much, John, and good evening, everyone. Absolutely delighted to see you all back to this, the fifth and last in the series of lectures. I think you'll all agree with me that it's been a very worthwhile exercise, and I'm sure Again, like me, you'll be looking forward to the, the next series of lectures starting in September. 
Tonight's speaker is, yet again, someone who really needs no great introduction from me. Malcolm McRae is very well known, especially in the Edinburgh area. Albeit his mother lodge, he followed in his father's footsteps, and he was initiated into, and I'll just read this because I always get it back to front, uh, Old Inverness co-winning St John number six in Inverness. And uh, Malcolm has been the director of music in uh, number six for over 30 years now. But of course, moving down with his profession into Edinburgh, he affiliated, first of all, to Lodge Canongate co-winning. Uh, he was the right worshipful master there uh, from 2000 to 2003. He's also served the Lodge as the Lodge Secretary. He's currently the master-elect in Edinburgh's newly uh, joined up lodges. Uh, we have the two lodges who came together uh, last year and Malcolm is the master-elect in what is now Lodge Scotia Trinity number 885. Likewise, he's a member of Sir Robert Murray 1641. But he is a very accomplished organist, and he plays the organ not only at lodge meetings, but in many other orders. Uh, Malcolm is the, the organist for those orders, and I'm sure many of you have met him in that context. Brethren, I have great pleasure in introducing Malcolm to you this evening and we'd ask you to give him a very, very warm welcome and we look forward to his uh, talk this evening on Lodge Canongate co-winning number two. Malcolm. Thank you, Most Possible Grandmaster Mason, for that uh, very kind introduction to Brother Malcolm McRae. And just before I invite Malcolm to speak, again, I would just ask uh, uh, the Brethren Assembles, will you please uh, ensure that you remain muted with your videos on and hold any questions until the Q&A session to follow Malcolm's talk. And I would now invite uh, Brother Malcolm McRae, sir, if you would uh, proceed and give us your talk on uh, Lord Canongate co-winning number two. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Brethren. Mr. Chairman, may I request that the screen share is permitted for me, please? And we'll see if we can get something that remotely looks like a PowerPoint presentation. Tell me if it goes wrong. Hope it doesn't. And Brethren, I begin with a thanks to the most worshipful Grandmaster Mason for his generous introduction of myself to you, and a thanks to the History Group for arranging this lecture series that has been to date of a high standard. I hope that I continue as such and hand on this role to my successor, pure and unsullied as I now receive it. I also thank the brethren of Canongate Kilwinning for having the faith in me to give this presentation and for the help that they have been in the background, especially past masters, Ronnie Jameson and Charles Stewart. I hope that most of you will find something new in what I have to say, and as a wee caveat, I'm not an expert in the history of Lodge Canongate Kilwinning. So, I, so just don't avoid, so it's just that I didn't avoid being volunteered for this task. So if you know I'm mistaken in anything, then please let me know. I would add that this talk represents only my views not of anyone else's. And as you can see on the screen, I've listed most of my references from this talk. I first attended Lodge Canongate Kilwinning in, in 1988, when the Lord Elgin gave the oration at the Lodge's famous festival of Burns and Hogg, with Sir Archie or Ewing in the chair. Over the next few years, I was told of various aspects of the history of Lodge Canongate Kilwinning, mostly by helpful visitors. And so sometimes they are not the best of sources. Being a visitor myself, I just listened and stored them away. Some of these stories I now know to be true, 
but some of them have no evidence to substantiate. Some of the stories I've been told were of to do with the early operative history of Lodge Canongate Kilwinning. Indeed, I was told that they descended from operative masons at Holyrood Abbey. I was told about the relationship with the Grand Lodge of Scotland and how Canongate Kilwinning has always been a great supporter of that institution. I was told about the Chapel of St John, where Canongate Kilwinning meets, and being the oldest purpose-built Masonic premises in the world. I was told about the Schnetzler organ and how it had been played by Handel. And I was told about the role of Lodge members, which include various Victoria Cross holders and various luminaries of the past, including Robert Burns and James Hogg. I will address some of these stories. Let's talk about the early operative history Poor slide I grant, but clearly taken well before lockdown. Lodge Canongate Kilwinning is certainly an old lodge, having complete minutes from the 13th of February 1735, but clearly not as old as some of the lodges from whom we've already heard. Lodge Canongate Kilwinning, as the name implies, meets in the former borough of the Canongate, which is now part of Edinburgh. Legend has it that David I was hunting in the royal forest of Drumshuch when he was thrown from his horse below Salisbury Crags after it had been startled by a stag. There are various versions of this story, but each one relates to the fact that the king was saved from being gored by the charging animal when the stag was startled by the miraculous appearance of a holy rood or crucifix. This is reflected in the emblem of the cannon gate being that of a stag's head with a crucifix between the antlers. And as you can see here, it's incorporated into the lodge elm emblem. As an act of thanksgiving, David I founded Holyrood Abbey in 1128. The abbey has been the venue for many high profile events including meetings of the Scottish Parliament, various coronations and burials, marriages and births, and indeed, over the 500 years, major building works have taken place at Holyrood, finally culminating in 1633 when there was a, an extensive remodeling prior to the coronation of Charles I. However, all that remains of the church now is just the nave. Despite the very high profile of, the, of Holyrood and the many and extensive building works over 500 years, there is no evidence of any formal connection between Holyrood and Canongate Kilwinning. In previous lectures, mention has been made of the Shaw Statutes of 1598 and 1599. And here is a facsimile of part of the first statue, statute taken from the book of Murray Lyon. For those of you who don't know about the Shaw statues, and forgive me if you know about them, they were written by William Shaw, who was a master of works to James VI and general warden of the Master Stone Masons. The first statute describes a hierarchy of wardens, deacons, and masters. And interesting to note that of those, the warden was the one in charge and the masters were just the members of the lodge. This structure would ensure that masons did not take on work for which they were not competent to complete and ensured a lodge warden, i.e. the equivalent of the current master, would be elected by the master masons. Interestingly, six master masons and two entered apprentices had to be present for a master or fellow of the craft to be admitted. Various other rules were laid out for the running of the lodge, including supervision of work and fines for non-attendance at lodge meetings. Indeed, I won't point it out, but later on, I will be showing some minutes, and there's a very interesting minute for those of you who can come to Lodge Canongate Kilwinning, and I might show it to you about how 
diligent they were at charging members who didn't attend lodge meetings. I'm not sure that would be very effective today to bring in such a rule. The second statute states that Kilwinning was a head and second lodge in Scotland. Curiously, Shaw also states that the Edinburgh Lodge would be the most important, followed by Kilwinning and then Stirling. Now, in 1599, Shaw was actually supervising building works at the Palace of Holyrood. And here is a carving of Holyrood at that time. And the work in involved masons, slaters, plumbers and joiners making repairs to the court and the king's kitchens. The steeple and clock, which actually if you look to the right of that, car that carving on the tower at the far right, that's where the, the clock tower was. And finally, they were to repair the king's billiard table, which I think is very amusing. My personal thought is that if Lodge Canongate Kilwinning were to have existed at this time and had been involved in works at Holyrood House, then it surely would have been mentioned in the second statute. However, the oldest document referring to Canongate Kilwinning is actually from 1677, which is in the minutes of Mother Kilwinning when Masons of the Canongate petitioned Mother Kilwinning for permission to form a lodge. And here we see, this is a facsimile again taken from the book by Murray Lyon, and it's a facsimile of the petition. I don't suppose that the handwriting is terribly good, but interesting to note that if you look at the top of the list, you'll see a chap, William Cochran, and you'll see a wee sort of man thing behind, beside him, that was his mark. Now, if you count up the marks, you'll find there's only nine marks, but 11 people have signed the letter. Looking in the minutes of the Canning Gate later on, we find this, which is a handwritten version of it. And right in the middle, you'll see William Cochrane with a wee squiggly man next to him. So they even bothered to transcribe out the marks. Anyway, so I have a great difficulty with that story that Lodge Canongate kill winning directly from operative masons at Holyrood. But let's think about briefly the incorporation and coopers of the Canongate. That's a pretty horrible picture, but it's the skyline of the Canongate Kirk. So I apologize if it's all blurry as it is on my screen. Anyway, it's worth noting that the Cannon Gate was a separate borough outside Edinburgh until 1856. The incorporation of rights and coopers of the Cannon Gate received a seal of cause or letter of license in 1612. In 1636, Edinburgh acquired the feudal superiority of the Cannon Gate in settlement of debt. Edinburgh Council then began choosing the Baileys and some of the councillors. But no attempt was to make the craft incorporations of the Canongate directly subordinate to those of Edinburgh. The Canongate Masons were listed first amongst the lesser trades in the Canongate Incorporation records. This rather lowly position indicate that the Masons had not been as successful in asserting their superiority among the building trades as the Edinburgh Masons had been. The Canongate Incorporation acted much like that of Edinburgh, though on a much smaller scale, by regulating the building trades within the borough and its minutes begin in 1630. The incorporation was unusual, though not unique, in that it licensed Cowans to work in the Cannon Gate, although they were not admitted to membership. The earliest example is listed in 1636. 
Cowens were licensed quite frequently in the 1650s and the 1660s. They were not permitted to work on everything, but they were admitted to work with stone and clay, but not lime, except they could use it to cast door, um, timber door and window frames and clay chimney heads. I understand from someone more knowledgeable than myself that this indicates that the Cowans were free to construct the houses of the poor, but not the more substantial or permanent buildings. I think it's fair to guess that it's the Canongate Masons would disapprove of the incorporation granting Cowans a recognised status. However, they actually had no, would have had no say in preventing this. At that time, there was other work-related difficulties which made moving from being a journeyman or employee to a master mason. Unfortunately, there is no evidence for any lodge in the Canongate before 1677, though there may have been one, and quite likely, which has disappeared without case, without trace. I'm led to believe that in a few instances, Canongate Masons were known to have attended the two known nearby lodges, being Mary's Chapel and Aitchison Haven, which no longer exists. For example, Stevenson in his book tells us that in 1648, John Johnson was admitted to the Canongate Incorporation, but does not appear to be listed as a member of either Mary's Chapel or Aitchison Haven, which could imply that my sentence a few minutes ago, seconds ago, about there being a lodge that has disappeared is maybe true. In 1660, Johnson decided that his apprentice should be admitted to Johnson's Lodge. But it is interesting to question which lodge was meant, because again, it's not mentioned in Mary's Chapel or H.S. and Haven. I've already mentioned that the oldest document referring to Canongate Kilwinning is this minute of Mother Kilwinning. This event is well documented by both Mackenzie and Murray Lyons, so for the interested, I'm sorry, I'm not going to refer to it much here, but do look at it and do look it up and you will find it quite interesting. However, it's interesting to speculate as to why the Canongate Masons approached Kilwinning for permission. I understand that seeking authority from an existing lodge to establish a new one is not something found anywhere else at this time. Kilwinning was, as I've mentioned, given a special status in the Second Shaw Statute. So this may be the reason why contact was made. I believe there's nothing in the Kilwinning minutes to indicate that there had been any contact with the Cannon Gate before 1677 or thereafter. I make the bold assumption that this petition was in fact an act of defiance. This would explain why the authority of Kilwinning should be invoked to establish a new one, because obviously Kilwinning would like to give its blessing to a new lodge and possibly have some inroads into Edinburgh the, on the doorstep of its rival Mary's Chapel. Once permission, as I've said, there appears to be no contact with kill winning. This act of defiance is something similar to other events that happened a few decades later, which may be addressed in future, le record, um, future le lectures leading to the formation of other lodges like Canongate and Leith and of the Lodge of Journeyman Masons. Anyway, moving swiftly onwards, as they say, up to the 1730, there is no real evidence of the proceedings of Lodge Canongate Kilwinning. And here, this is the first minute of Lodge Canongate Kilwinning. Now the minutes start, as I've mentioned, in 13th of February 1735, at which time Mackenzie estimates that the Lodge had about 10 active members. This minute appears to be a business meeting at which several brethren, 
including one George Fraser, more of whom later, are charged with forming bylaws and regulations. The second minute is of a meeting a fortnight later, at which George Fraser is elected the secretary, then admitted as a fellow of Kraft. You may notice as a William Montgomery was initiated at this meeting. He actually ended up becoming the first right worshipful master of Leithkill winning, from which branched off the present St David's University Lodge. And there's a mention later of Leithkill winning as well. Another interesting early minute is of the 31st of March, 1735, at which George Fraser, the same George Fraser, is admitted as Master Mason and immediately elected as Senior Warden. Rather a meteoric rise. Later that year in September, a committee was formed for, pro for framing proposals to be laid before several lodges in order to the choosing a Grand Master for Scotland. And here we see William St. Clair of Roslyn, was, who was eventually chosen as the, the first Grand Master, as he was referred to in the minutes. So being historically accurate, with, apologi with apologies to yourself, Brother Ramsey, I will refer to you as the Grand Master, because that's how the Brethren of the Time referred to um, St. Clair. Anyway, so, they, the, so there was a committee formed to decide and St. Clair of Roslyn was chosen. So the next important step was to actually ensure his initiation, which I find quite amusing. On the 15th of October that year in 1736, delegates from Mary's Chapel, Canongate Kilwinning, Kilwinning Scots Arms and Leith Kilwinning met and decided how to actually elect the Grand Master for Scotland. And on the 3rd of November, St. Clair was actually nominated by the Canongate Kilwinning for the office of Grand Master Mason. And 19 days later, St. Clair was given the degree of Master Mason. So maybe Masonic precedence is, um, well, it's a bit odd that you wouldn't even be a Master Mason, but you could become Grand Master Mason. Here we actually see, as when it comes up, my computer seems to be, there it is. Oh well, we've lost one. Never mind. I would have said that here was actually the meeting, the minute of the 2nd of December, 13, 1736. Oh, never rely on, on um, technology. And it was actually two, two days after he'd been installed as Grand Master, and it's actually signed by St. Clair as Grand Master. I mentioned earlier that I've been told that Canongate Kilwinning was always a keen supporter of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. We might as well go back to that one. I shall not expand on the events of the early 1800s, but the Lodge withdrew from the Grand Lodge of Scotland together with other lodges, including Mary's Chapel, the Caledonian Lodge, not, I stress, the current one, St Andrew and St David, under the title of The Associated Lodges Seceding from the Present Grand Lodge of Scotland. This is actually a very well documented elsewhere, but suffice it to say that the issue was so serious it reached as far as the Prince of Wales. The Lodge premises. So when it always slightly amuses me when provincial turn up and after being presented with them all, they then say, and the fealty of this lodge has never been in doubt, because clearly it has been. The lodge premises. The building of the Chapel of St. John was a major undertaking by the lodge in 1736. It was consecrated in December of that year by George Fraser, whom I mentioned earlier, as Master of Works, who by this stage was Right Worshipful Master, and this was done in the presence of St. Clair in his role as Grand Master. This was paid for by members of the Lodge. 
Works and repairs continued over many years with the minutes describing various problems about the construction of the chapel. And these are quite well described by Mackenzie, so again, I won't go over it. I must apologise, I've not included slides of this famous Masonic jewel, as it's actually better for you to see it yourself. The internet actually has photos if you want to see it and have a look at the Canning Gate Kill winning website, there might be something there. One of the very interesting features of the lodge that bears reference is what appears to be four recessed statues. These are called a trope d'ail, pardon my expression, which is a trick or an optical illusion. Unfortunately, the lodge no longer owns the buildings, but is very blessed with fantastic landlords. Anyway, at this time, various gifts were presented to the lodge, including a breeches Bible. We still have the original jewels for the master and wardens. The master still uses his jewel to lodge meetings. And as you can see, that it's rather battle scar scarred over the years. It is of no real intrinsic value from the point of view of money, but Masonically is beyond compare. It's made of base metal and just crystals really, but it was made and fashioned in 1736. Next to those you see the war original warden's jewels. We only use those at installation. Another gem of the chapel is the famous hand-pumped Schnetzler organ. It was built in London in 1756 and installed into the Canongate Gate in 1757. Schnetzler had his organ building studio very near to where Handel lived in London, so it's interesting to speculate whether Handel played it. Handel was known to have really enjoyed Schnetzler's work. Indeed, the first performance of the Messiah, Handel specified it, the organ continuo had to be played on a Schnetzler organ. That was in Dublin. Unfortunately, Handel, in the, in the, late, the, the beginnings of the 1750s, started to suffer from diabetes. And by 1753, and three years before this organ was built, he was blind. So it's debatable as to whether he would have actually gone in to see it. The pun was intended, sorry. Anyway, the Lodge Roll, as I've mentioned, is blessed with many well-known members, but more especially by the many lesser-known members who've supported the Lodge over 350 years. In the minute of the 1st of February 1787, mention is made that Robert Burns was in attendance and was admitted as an honorary member. James Hogg. The Ettrick Shepherd went through all of his degrees in one day in the back room of the Cleekham Inn in Inner Leithen. He claimed that he was far too old to travel to Edinburgh. Indeed, the mention of Burns and Hogg bring us back full circle to my first visit to number two. I enjoyed my first visit that I made to the Cannon Gate so much that I've hardly been away for over 32 years. I hope that I've given a brief insight into one of the former operative lodges in the craft and hope that one day you may feel the need to visit Lodge Cannon Gate Kilmining, when I can regale you with more of my ramblings. I thank you, brethren, all for your attention. Well, thank you, Brother McRae, for that uh, very informative uh, history lesson on Cannon Gate Kilmining number two, and for your not so subtle invitation to come and uh, uh, visit your lodge. Uh, for those who haven't been to uh, uh, that particular lodge, kind of get coming number two, it's a must. It's a beautiful lodge. You must visit. Um, thank you again, Malcolm. That was excellent. Thoroughly enjoyed uh, your detailed presentation. Uh, and I would now invite uh, Brother Charles Watson, 
sorry, Winston, <laughs> sorry, Charles. Uh, Charles, do we have any questions for Brother McRae? I don't have any questions currently um, in the chat room, Mr. Chairman, but I would like to ask, um, are there any Mason's marks on in Holyrood itself? I am not actually aware of that. I'm sure there are, but I'm not, I apologise, I'm not actually aware of that. Although that would be a very interesting thing. Our Lodge Mark Minutes book, um, Lodge Min Mark book does still exist. In fact, I looked at some Lodge uh, Marks not so long ago, and it was clear that from 18, the mid 1800s onwards, occasionally the marks could not have ever been Masonic marks in that if you actually turned them upside down, it would look like someone else's one. So no, unfortunately, but we do have quite an extensive list of marks from our speculative period, but not from any operative period. We have a question from Brother Stephen O'Donnell. And um, would you unmute yourself, please, Brother Stephen? He's, he's raised his hand. Sorry, I don't have a question. I, I, I turned it away. Sorry. Are there any other questions, Brother? Um, well, uh, Charles, I wonder if I may just ask uh, Brother McCray. Uh, I'd always been led to believe that uh, Handel did play that organ. Are you saying that that didn't happen? All I'm saying is that it is correct that the workshop in which it was built was just next to where Handel lived. And for those of you who have a more contemporary feeling that Jimi Hendrix's house was just there as well. But it's just that I think to myself that Handel was blind from three years before the, the organ was built. Mm -hmm. So that's just me putting an interpretation on. There's perfectly understandable that he might nip in, nip, speak to Mr. Schnetzler, and he might say, I've got a couple more organs. What interesting to note is that at the time that that organ was put in, there was eight or other organs built by Schnetzler of a similar type and size installed around Edinburgh. So he was quite prolific in his building of these organs, um, but there is no definitive proof that he played it, but it is a possibility. And perhaps if he did play it, it would have been in, in London, was it? it? Yes, because the workshop in was in London. Yeah. It was then packed onto into crates and taken from London by sea up to Edinburgh to Leith Docks from where it was then put on the back of a horse and cart and taken up to the lodge premises. We do have a question from Brother Ian Robertson. Um, is it true that the master uses a mall that was used in the building of Rosalind Chapel? I would say that that is, that's certainly one of our, um, I'm just trying to think of, a, it's certainly one of our, um, legends, one of our stories that we do like to say in that it was apparently, if I remember correctly, given by William St. Clair, but I'm not sure at the time there was any suggestion that it was actually used at the building of Roslyn, which would have been, because that was 1444 or thereabouts, so that would have been a good, doing my sums in my head, at least 300 years before that. The, the building of Canning Gate Kill winning. So it's, again, it's a possibility, but there's no definitive proof. But thank you, Ian, for that question, which actually was quite an easy one for you because I thought you'd ask something about the, the incorporation. And Brother Alexander Moncrief is asking, um, is he right in saying that the lodge room is the oldest purpose-built lodge room in existence? I would be inclined to say it's certainly the oldest purpose-built per, um, premises for Freemasonry because, for example, we heard um, down in Melrose that they did have lodge premises that they built themselves and other lodges have built them, but they would have been wooden. And, for example, uh, you could possibly suggest that some of these chart rooms, for example, in York Minster might have been 
served as a lodge room type thing, but there's no definitive proof, but certainly one would say that of speculative Freemasonry, it's beyond doubt that um, Canongate Kilwinning's lodge premises are the oldest purpose built in the world. And uh, there's a debate apparently that number 10 also um, claims to be the oldest, also from Brother Ian Robertson. That one, that one was sorted out several years ago in that um, Dalkeith Kilwinning's building was actually built in about 1750 something. And the, the claim that Canongate Kilwinning wasn't the oldest purpose built one was an erroneous claim that it was actually a house before it was a lodge premises. It, which, and that came from the fact that on the wall there is a picture, there's a portrait of a lady and someone assumed that that meant that it was a house. It, it was just some, a misunderstanding that managed to get, uh, you might say it got legs and ran away with it. Could you say something about the Lord, uh, Lodge Edinburgh St Giles? I understand that the, the two lodges combined in 1779. Yes, Lodge St Giles was an, um, a lodge that came out of Kilwinning. It came out of, it was, I think it came out of Canongate Kilwinning. It certainly was prior to that. I think it was known as Vernon Kilwinning. And I've no idea why it was called Vernon Kilwinning, except for it could have been if my, my assertion was that Canongate Kilwinning was trying to rub the nose of other Masons in it, as you might say, then by creating another lodge with the name Kilwinning in it would help rub it a bit further. But there was also, as I mentioned, was Leith Kilwinning. Leith Kilwinning also came from Canongate Kilwinning, but that became part, that from that there became a split and there it was it's debatable as to whether Leith Kilwinning became St David's University Lodge or whether there was a split within Leith Kilwinning to become St David's. It's so the, we have had several lodges come out of Canongate Kilwinning with the name Kilwinning and they sometimes disappear. That's a bit of a ramble. An interesting thing about um, St. David's, uh, the University Lodge, it actually had an organ prior to Canongate Kilwinning. We had certainly the, uh, our organ went in in 1757, but it was mentioned about, I think about 1742, there was mention in the minute of the now St. David's University Lodge that they had an organ which could have been a harmonium, you know, where you pump it with your feet. But I believe the early minute book of St. David's has now been lost. So the references to the early part of St. David's comes from other sources, not from the minutes. So it is a bit of ramble for you. Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions at the moment, unless anyone has any further questions. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a last uh, opportunity for a question for Brother McRae. Yes, uh, I have one of you. Uh, you make up a change. I was interested, interested uh, Malcolm, to hear you speak about the, f the fines that were levied uh, in uh, the Mark Book of Aberdeen, uh, the Lodge of Aberdeen. There's a considerable part of the rules spent on fines uh, and what they were, how they were raised and who paid them and what the, the specific amounts were. Uh, and the money was used to finance the festival of St. John once a year. Uh, and we have some of the uh, the bills for that. And they must have raised a fair amount of money. Uh, was it some, do you know what they did with the fines? And I don't actually know exactly what they did with the fines because I don't, the minutes, the, although the, the minutes actually do refer to some of the tran financial transactions, it doesn't mention what was actually done with them. However, it's very interesting to note that 
I'm trying to remember the, ex the exact dates. It was fairly soon after this, the minute started. So this would have been about the 1750s, maybe 1740s. That the monthly subscription was something like one one shilling and sixpence. But don't forget there was the premises was quite expensive. So most you would probably find that most of the f the fines, the fees went into paying off the debt on the premises. And Canongate Kilwinning was quite assiduous in chasing up arrears because if you missed a meeting, you paid your one and six and you also had to pay a fine of one and six and for every meeting that you missed. So uh, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was quite a clever way of raising money, I think. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, Malcolm. And again, thank you for your presentation and for your uh, answering of the several questions this evening. Well done, sir. Thank you. I would invite uh, uh, Most Possible Grand Master Mason, Brother Ramsey McGee, if you'd care to say a few words. I know he has to, to dash away. He has another appointment. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, could I thank Malcolm for a, a very enlightening uh, presentation this evening. I thoroughly enjoyed the presentation. In fact, all five have been very enjoyable, and if I could take this opportunity on behalf of you all uh, to thank uh, John Miller, Charles, and their team for putting the, the presentations together. Uh, we, we've averaged over 80 people at every, every meeting, so they have been very popular indeed. So thank you very much, brethren, for all the, the time and effort you've put into organizing them. And we really look forward to the second series once that starts up in September, which is not terribly far away. So my sincere thanks to you all for supporting this venture uh, organized by the History and Heritage Group. Uh, and I bid you all a very good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Brother Ramsey. Master Mason, for uh, your kind words. And, uh, uh, again, I must uh, thank you on behalf of the History and Heritage uh, Group for your unstinting support. I think that's five out of five of these presentations that you've uh, taken the time and trouble to uh, uh, to be involved with and to participate. It's very much appreciated and uh, um, early yet, but perhaps we can call on you to assist again uh, when we uh, resume in uh, September. Thank you, sir. Much Look appreciated. forward to it. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, well, as we mentioned just a second ago, uh, that, that concludes our first series, the first five of our oldest lodges. Uh, the second series um, is born out of the success of this first series, as already been indicated, we've, we've had uh, large uh, audiences, and, uh, and I hope that they've all enjoyed it, I'm sure they have. Uh, so we're now having this series two. Uh, the date that we have in mind uh, for the beginning is on the 10th of September, however, we have a history and heritage group meeting this coming Sunday where we will discuss um, the second series and we'll just check out if that date uh, uh, for commencement, 10th of September, uh, is uh, suitable for all the participants, all the lodges and of course for the brethren. Uh, at the moment, uh, our next presentation uh, will be the first in series. That will be as I say, on Thursday the 10th of September at 7pm, still to be confirmed and of course we will notify everyone very shortly about that uh, that date and its confirmation or the alternative. That On that occasion, uh, uh, Lodge Schoon in Perth number three uh, has been invited to present the history of that lodge and uh, the speaker, the volunteer, is Brother Alexander McCreef, who is currently the master of the lodge and of course a uh, uh, Grand Senior Warden. Um, full of details uh, on date, etc., will be confirmed as soon as possible, Bill, so that you are kept up to speed on that date as a confirmation or alternate and alternate meeting on Sunday requires a change. Thank you, Bill. If um, before we uh, we close, um, we'll have a, a short open mic uh, opportunity for any brother who would wish to say. Hello, cheerio, or congratulations to Brother McRae, or whatever crosses their mind. So for a, a couple of minutes, Brother, 
open mics, I'll hand it over to you, Brian, if you could perhaps give everybody the opportunity. Well, I'm sure, Brother Malcolm, I'd like to thank you both for an excellent evening. Thoroughly enjoyed each and every one of the presentations and look forward to the next one. Thank you, Malcolm. Tom, thank you very much, Tom. You set a very high bar. <laughs> well done, Malcolm. It's an excellent lecture. Very thank interesting. Thank you very much. Thank Lovely you, to see you, Anthony. Okay. Nice all the way from the Caribbean. Yes, Malcolm, I want to thank you for inviting me and I will look forward to um you know <clears throat> joining other um zoom meetings of this kind if invited or hope that i can be but um thank you very much for your historical presentation thank you very much. I, did you say there was a a rec is a recording will be available i believe so yes tomorrow Tomorrow, yes. channel. Yes, it'll, it'll be posted in a, quite a number of provincial and district uh, Grand Lodge groups. Good, thank you. Okay. Can I just so say to the Bartlett, are you way down there in Cheltenham? We thought you were far travelled to join our meeting tonight, but uh, I'm afraid the the brother from Barbados is just a wee bit further <laughs> away than uh, in Cheltenham. Right. Yes, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> I was going to say, well done to History and Heritage. It's been an absolutely fantastic yeah. series. And to Malcolm this evening, genius. I loved your presentation and the balance that you brought to the material that you presented to us. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Second. Thank you, Malcolm, for that. Excellent. Well done. Not at all. Glad you enjoyed it. I'm just on a meeting, so. Well done, Malcolm. Well done. Thank you very much. I did. I was very tempted to put lots of pictures of Canning yeah. Gate winning premises on it, but I thought we'll th we'll dangle that as a carrot for you to come and see us. No <laughs> worth a visit, Bellum. Good old careful. Well done, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to all involved in the history uh, programme. It's been fantastic. I've only managed to catch three of them this uh, session, but absolutely first class. So congratulations to all involved, and well done to you tonight, Malcolm. Well, thank well you to you, Andy, for digitising our Lodge Minute books, and oh, you right. saw the benefit of what you did. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your continued support, Andy. Pleasure. Okay. Thank you very Greetings much, brother, uh, and uh, thank you all for allowing an outsider from the English Constitution to be with you at these last meetings. And I hope you'll allow uh, me and Paul to uh, to come to the next series. Thank you very much indeed. Just to say thanks very much indeed for a, an excellent presentation there, and I look forward to the uh, the next set uh, in September. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Nice to hear Kill winning here in good droves. Good uh, brother, uh, bring you fraternal greetings from uh, the Grand Lodge of uh, Florida in the U.S. Uh, thank you for allowing this uh, U.S. Mason, but also a proud Scottish Mason from the uh, uh, District Grand Lodge of the Bahamas, uh, 1838. Uh -huh. oh, yes. yes, Joe Curry will... You'll know Joe Eddie Curry, yes. Welcome. Oh, Joe very well. Hello, Malcolm. Hello. Is Terry here? <laughs> nice to see you, Terry. I was just waiting in that few tunes off here at the end. Well, I thought I would, I, I, I'm saving up all my wrong notes for real lodge meetings. <laughs> well done. Welcome. And I look forward to taking up your very kind invitation to lodge number two. Oh, yes, please. Do, do, Alex. It'd be a joy to see you down here. Thank you. Enjoy to be here.